All right, welcome everybody. This is a capturing real-world material for real-time development. I'm Luc Vauvin, a senior solution engineer in automotive, and this is Camille Rell, my photometry artist. So, why did we do this uh, presentation? Well, the first thing is you guys know about HDRP, right? We wanted an easy way for you to see how to create material in HDRP, and uh, we've wanted to find a solution that was easy, uh, that was inexpensive, that's inexpensive, and artist friendly in the sense that you can go tweak the material after to give it a little artistic touch. And we wanted you guys to have complete control over the process. That's why we're giving away this process. And um, I hope you guys are gonna like it. Hmm? No, that's good. So it's gonna be coming out in 2018.3. It's gonna be for free on the asset store. Uh, we have a beta, so if you guys want access or early access to anything, just send me a, an email. And the material library is composed of over 120 materials uh, evaluation. There's leather, paint, car paint, caliper, and so on. Here's a, a little sample. And <clears throat> sorry about that. And you'll have a copy of this presentation. We'll go pretty fast because there's a lot of things to cover. And um, I'm going to let her talk because she talks super fast. And uh, <laughs> So, yep, yeah, go ahead. Really sorry about that. Um, so basically, we wanted to create realistic looking materials in Unity using photometric stereo processing. Uh, it's really, uh, it's, um, I'd say it's another way of, it's a method for saying photometry. So what is photometric stereo processing? Well, photometric stereo analyzes multiple images of an object under different lighting conditions to estimate a normal direction at each pixel. So this is directly taken from Wikipedia. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> along with this image, but I thought it just explained really well. So you have these four images at the top where they, they are capturing the same item, the, say, the same 3D model or the same image, but they all have different lighting directions and angles. And together with all of this information, you can generate this normal map. And this is what our talk is going to be about. So we're going to have multiple images at different lighting angles and directions, and we're going to be able to generate different maps using this method. So we'll now take you through our photometric stereo processing workflow and we'll show you each step so you can have a better understanding of how photometry works in general and get a better idea of how you can do it yourself. Um, this presentation will be, split, will be split into two parts. You'll have the manual part and the digital part. Basically, the manual part is the photo capturing. It's everything that you do with the camera manually. And the digital part is everything at the computer, so processing, correcting, and integration. Here is um, the list of all that we need for the manual part. So um, this is really tiny, okay? So, but you're gonna have access to the PowerPoint. So, and uh, you don't necessarily need all of the same items that I've listed. It's just like uh, as an it's just as an info. This is what we use. So first off, we need a DCA DSLR uh, 50 millimeter. 50 millimeter lens camera with a uh, circular polarizing and UV HRT filter. You also need a tripod to put that camera on it, and then you need a speed light transmitter, which also will be on top of your camera. You need another speed light transmitter that will be on its own tripod with a seven centimeter cardboard taped on top. The cardboard is really important because uh, you're gonna use the um, uh, you're going to use the plastic polarizing filter, the polarizing film on the right, and you're going to get it really close to uh, your flash. And since you don't want to burn your filter, then you want that, that like seven centi centimeter distance from one another. So you also need a color checker, some chrome balls, a Canon camera app to control uh, the camera from a distance, obviously some material samples, spare batteries, because this is going to drain a lot of batteries, and you don't want to spend your whole time waiting, so you're going to need some spares, and some tape. Now, setting up the room. So here's a sketch of our room setup. The camera should be at the center and facing uh, the ground on its tripod, and you'll be moving around these eight spots with your flash. Here is a picture of our old photometry room in our old office. Uh, as you can see on the right picture, we installed some black uh, opaque fabric on our walls because the white was too reflecting on our materials, on our chrome ball, and this could create uh, some artifacts and get some error information which we don't want. So here's a clearer image of a setup in our new office. Since our photometry room isn't ready yet, I took this photo in a random, like, pretty large room that could contain um, all of this material. But know that this is way too clear of a room, and it's not going to give you accurate uh, photometry captures. So this is not ideal. But I have a, 
a lot of pictures in this room just for the sake of this demo because our old one is dead. But um, we'll just continue with this. Okay, step two is the polarizer setup. This is kind of a tricky part, so I'll try my best to explain this in a nice way. So what's a polarizing filter? Well, it's a filter that surpasses polarized light. It's used in photography to uh, reduce or remove reflections. So on this picture, so sometimes you see these photographers, they, they take pictures and they, they have these, um, these polarizing lenses and they put them on their camera and then if they rotate it, then they can have a really nice clear picture without any reflection like the one you see on the right. So with this filter, then he doesn't see the reflection of the sky. Uh, why is it useful? Well, by capturing images with and without reflection, we can easily isolate the light information and create a base color map and a smoothness map. Why do I mean by that? So this is a capture of a material that I did in the new room, and as you can see on the picture on the left, I have all of my reflections, while on the one on the right, I don't have any. So by using the filter, um, I can have these two pictures, and now uh, that I have the picture on the right, I would subtract this one from the picture on the left to only isolate the light information. So to do, <coughs> sorry. So to do that, uh, you gotta make sure that the polarizing UV filter arrow is at the top of your lens on your camera, because this will influence uh, the, your polarizing filter angle. So you should really have yours on top, because the rest of what we're gonna say is not gonna be accurate if you don't. Okay, now you gotta find the right angle. Since a polarizing filter works differently depending on the angle, you need to find the right angle which will serve as your guide. Our guide should let the light completely pass through, when, but when rotated 90 degrees, it should block all of the light. It should block all polarized light, excuse me. So once you get it, you draw an arrow on top. So on this GIF, when I have it at the top, it lets, it, it lets the light passes through, but when I turn it 90 degrees, all polarized light, um, is blocked. So since this is a phone and the light from a phone isn't polarized, uh, this is why you see like bits of it. But the rest has been blocked. So again, in a less uh, giphy way, uh, at the top, you see I have my guide at the top and this gives me the image underneath and when I rotate it 90 degrees, I have the image that is without any reflection. So uh, now let's go back to this picture and see how we would be rotating around with our filter. Okay. So I start on point one and rotate counterclockwise. The red arrow represents the arrow that I drew on my cardboard, which is my guide arrow. And the gray arrow is, doesn't really exist, it just represents the 90 degree rotation that I do with my cardboard. Uh, so this one would give me the image without any reflection, while the red one would let the reflection pass through. So as you can see, I'm rotating in a circle in 45 degrees around my camera, and so does my polarizing filter. I'm gonna show you a small vi uh, short video explaining how this works. So here, I'm at the, my first point, I rotate 90 degree, and then I take my picture. And then I move around, turn 45 degree, and I'm gonna turn my cardboard at the diagonal angle, and then I'm gonna rotate 90 degree from there. And then again, with the third spot. And that's basically just plus 45 every time. So yeah, that's what it would look like. Now, uh, I went a bit ahead of myself and showed a capture video. While we had not completed all the steps before doing so, so now we're gonna play with our flash and camera settings. We want the transmitter uh, on top of the camera to be set on master and the one on its own tripod to be set on slave. This way they'll both be connected to each other and one will trigger the other. We want them, to, we want them on, manual, on manual, excuse me, because we want to be able to play with settings. So your flash should point at the material samples from an angle of around 45 degrees from the ground. Okay, the app is actually really useful because uh, the camera will always be on its own tripod. So you'll be taking your pictures at a distance because you don't want to, because, well, you'll be at the other side uh, with your flash, so you won't be able to just press on the button. So uh, you're gonna use the app and you're also gonna use it to change the settings. So when you start, you put your, Okay, so when you start, uh, you're gonna have your um, color checker on the ground, and you will, want, you will want to lower the exposure until the color checker is dark, because we want only the light of the flash to be captured and not the ambient light. Okay, now for the actual capture. So like I said, you put down the color checker in the chrome ball. 
Um, the color checker is important because we'll be using it later on for color correcting in the processing part. And the chrome ball is really important because it understands the light direction and angle from which the flash comes from, which will be useful in generating the normal map. So here is just a GIF that shows you all the eight spots uh, where I would move around my camera, because on the other video I only showed three, so this is like, these are all the eight spots. So now um, that we have captured all of our pictures, we would result in 18 photos. So we have one of the color checker with reflection, one of the color checker without any reflection, eight of the material with reflection, and eight without reflection. Now for the digital part, we're, 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 halfway, we're halfway there. So you'll need Photoshop, you'll need a batch file to convert raw images to TIFF or any other way to convert raw images to any kind of format you want. You'll need NALD or any software that can generate maps from a normal map. The body capture, you'll need a tiling tool, and well, since we're integrating with Unity, uh, we're gonna need Unity and I'm using the HD render pipeline. So color correction. So all that we've done up till now has been kind of abstract. I've told you a lot of stuff, but all of the all of these uh, information you're gonna be able to like um, fill in the blanks. Yeah. Sure. So on the left you have this color checker with no color correction, and on the right you have the one with color correction. Uh, I'll take you through all of the steps for the color correction, but know that it is a very step by step method, so there won't be much uh, creativity there. Okay, so now I'm in Photoshop, I've opened my image, and as you can see on the right, I've created a folder uh, of action named Unite LA. Because I'm gonna have to color correct all of the images and I'm not gonna do this 18 times. So I've created my first one called Color Correction. So now I'm gonna change my image to a 32 bit image per channel. And I'm gonna select with my drop, uh, with my color picker, 11 by 11 average, and I'm gonna select my third gray sample from the left. Now I'm gonna select it as foreground, and as for the background, I'm gonna use a value of 0 0.36 on each RGB channel. Why this? Because that's the actual value of, that's the actual color value of um, this color checker in real life, of this gray sample. So now I'm filling it with this background color, and now I'm filling it another one with the foreground color. So what I'm gonna do is just, I'm gonna divide this one with the one underneath. Now I'm gonna merge it down to have only this white layer which I'm gonna change the mode for multiply. Okay, now, if I go back to my value, I remember the 0 0.36 value that I had. Now I'm gonna select this one, which is color corrected, and I see that the value is really close to 0 0.36, 0 .36, which is our real life value of this gray sample. So that means our color corrector has been, well, color corrected, to um, be more like real life. And now we're gonna merge the image, we're gonna turn it to 8 bits per channel. We're gonna choose uh, exposure and gamma. And that's it, we're gonna save and it's done. And we're gonna do this for the uh, 17 other pictures. So now that we have done this, we're gonna average albedo and smoothness. That's weird. So uh, like I previously mentioned, we can subtract the polarized photos from the photo rich reflection to isolate the light information and get a smoothness map. To do so, we first need to average these out. So we'll take all eight photos with, ref with reflection and create an average out of them and do the same again for the pictures without reflection. So once again, I'll go through the whole process. So I have this image there. I'm gonna take this one, take the seven other one. I'm gonna put them all in the same uh, Photoshop folder. Photoshop, like, whatever. I'm gonna turn it back to 32 bits per channel. I'm gonna, not gonna flatten, I'm not gonna rasterize it because I want the full resolution. Now I'm gonna take all of these layers, except for the background, and put them in linear dodge. Now I'm gonna select a fill layer that I'm gonna fill with a value of 888, which is gonna give me this white. Okay. Uh, now I'm gonna set this one on divide, and here it is. I have my average for the first eight pictures that I have taken uh, with reflection. And now I'm just gonna do the same for the eight other ones, and I'm gonna change it back to eight bit per channel because that's just what I do all the time. So assuming that I have done the same for the other eight other pictures, oops, this is, what, this is how uh, I would isolate the light information. So I have the second one. 
then I'm going to turn back the 32-bits per channel and going to copy it. I'm going to paste into this one that I also have to convert. And I am literally just going to subtract it. Like, that's it. So I'm just going to flatten it. And this is our smoothness. But since smoothness doesn't have color information, I'm just going to desaturate it after having it converted again. So this would be our smoothness map. So uh, basically, we just generated our base color map and our smoothness map. So what we're missing right now is the normal map. So if I go back to this image, uh, we realize now that these four images that we had on top with the four different light angles, well, we have the equivalent, but with eight different angles. So with this, we're going to generate our normal map using the Bardi. I don't have a video of this since it's mostly me dragging around folders into an EXE and just waiting for a result, which takes me like 20, mid, 20 minutes. But um, here is um, the Chrome balls. There, this is where the Chrome balls become really useful. So using the Chrome ball, the Bardi captures light information. So the red circle is created by the Bardi, and it tells us from which angle um, and from which direction the flash comes from. So with this, it's able to generate a normal map, like we saw in the previous picture. So on the left, you'd have your uh, normal map created directly from the Bardi. And on the right, you'd have the, the normal map that would be flattened using, uh, using the same software. And we're going to want it flattened because we're going to tile it, and uh, it's going to be just much easier. Now into texture tiling. So there really isn't a magic recipe for this, unlike with the average and unlike with the color correction. Like, there's no perfect value. But it really is a, a matter of trial and error. And it can become really tedious. Like I've done this so many times, and I've done so many variations of the same, uh, of the same texture. But it's necessary, and we have the Unity tiling tool to help us, and it's going to make our life a bit easier. So the Unity tiling tool, uh, it offers a lot of different settings. So like a normal shader, you can see at the bottom, you can change the tiling and offset to your liking, and you can see on top. You can add um, base color map, normal map, and spectral map, which, coincidentally, we have been working on for a while. So uh, the This Week channel also displays which map you want to see being changed in real time. So you can select which one you want. And um, that said, if, you are, if you're displaying the normal map, then you don't have to do the same changes for the two other ones afterwards. It all does the changes in real time. They all do it uh, together at the same time. So tile H and tile V represent where the seams are, and you can have them displayed or not. And um, by showing the mask, uh, you can see uh, where your seams are, and which we're going to see later on. Don't worry about it. OK, so I'm going to go through all of these. <laughs> so first off, we have rotation. Oh, I forgot to mention, I went ahead and I cropped these three images into square textures, because um, they weren't because you just needed a square sample. And uh, the other big resolution image at, like, on the right had the chrome ball, and we don't want that. So I, I cropped them, and I uploaded them to the Unity Tiling tool. So yeah, rotation. Pretty self-explanatory. It just rotates your texture. Additional rotation, like it says, it adds another rotation to the first one. This also has a small zoom effect. And uh, these two together, they just give you much more control over, what's, over the rotation that you want. Cancel gradient acts like a high pass in Photoshop. It uniforms your texture, so it's pretty useful when you have like, some obvious color variation that you want to get rid of, because you know that once tile, it's going to look just weird. But uh, be careful, because a higher value means a flatter texture. So if you put it at like 1, it's just going to look really flat. OK, border size. I purposely skipped offset, but I'll come back to it later. Uh, border size, it plays with the width of the area, which will hide your seam. So basically, it's your border. And uh, on the left, you can see that I'm playing with the setting while the mask is showed on. This is why it's all red. And on the right, I'm doing the same, but without the mask. So if I put a value of 0, then just nothing happens. Because uh, if I have a border with the size of 0, well, that means I don't have any border. So it won't be tiled. Yeah. So once I get a higher value, a border will be created, which will hide my seam. Having a bigger border is useful when you want to hide some artifact that's on your texture, but that's not as close to the seam as you'd like it to be. So that just gives you a lot of control over where you're going to seam. Now, going back to offset. Uh, to have a better control of tiling, I can play with my offset. 
This optional works the same as in the other Unity shaders, except it only affects, again, the seam and the borders, which we just played with. If I put a value of zero, nothing happens. Playing with the offset is useful in the case where I dislike the area where it was sampled from. Like if I want to get rid of an artifact, but by moving the offset, I can just easily hide it. Okay, mass continuity, it just reduces the noise of my border. Uh, usually, when the border is really large, uh, mass continuity doesn't work that well, so it's really more effective for smaller borders. Fade mask, well, it allows for a very soft transition between the border and the original texture. Uh, be careful when using this, because on the base color, it might look like really smooth and pretty, but on the normal map and on a smoothness map, it can get really awkward once tiled. So, so it just shows that you really have to play with your three display maps. You really have to see every one of them, how they look, and then be sure of what you're doing. Okay, separate frequencies. Uh, this one is a really weird option, so I'm gonna explain it. Setting it to zero won't do anything. Setting it to one will show you the result of all of the previous settings you've just played with. So why would you want a value that is now one, right? So setting it to a value of between zero and one will act as a blend between the two extremes. In some cases, your new tile texture will repeat a lot, and um, since it since it basically sampled the since it basically sampled the seam from somewhere else somewhere else on the texture, but you still want your texture to tie properly, so you can choose to blend the the, two, the original texture with the new one that you've just created to create some kind of variation, so it doesn't repeat that much while keeping it tileable. It's kind of complex. Um, it's not that clear on that GIF, sadly. Apologize for that. But uh, I basically just use it, I just play with the slider. I usually get higher values, closer to one, and I just play with it until I think it looks nice. And that's what all these settings are about. Like, it's, it's just a matter of playing with them until you, think they're, until you think they look nice. It's just a question of overall feel. So uh, I'm not gonna show these videos because we don't have time, but uh, I have them in the PowerPoint which we're gonna send to you, I think. So you're gonna have them if you wanna take a look at them. So it's basically a video of me playing with these settings and getting a tiled image, a tiled texture, like what I showed you in the GIF. So once again, this is another video that I'm not gonna show you, but I, I scanned this Unity notebook which has like a literary feel, and since the logo is really clear, then it might be easier for you to see how these settings work with these really clear images. Okay, we're almost done. <laughs> um, I skipped the part where I use Nald to generate the remaining textures because it's a really simple step which you don't have to do with Nald. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, tell you that what maps I've generated. So since I'm using, H I'm integrating into Unity and I'm using the HD render pipeline, so I'm using a mask map. So a mask map contains a metallic map, a ambient occlusion map, a detail map, and a smoothness map. So I've generated all of these and I've um, created a mask map out of them, which is the green one. And I've, uh, on the left you have shader graph, and uh, in the middle you have the lid shader. And then you basically, since you have your base color, your normal, and the other one that you've generated, you just plug them in. Like you just need to plug them. And as you can see, like automatically on the right, you'd have uh, your new material in Unity that was created using your real life sample. And um, that's pretty much it. Now you can have fun and do a nice render and have something like nicer looking than this. And um, while it, <laughs> that's pretty much it. So while it may seem like a really long and tedious process, believe me, it really isn't. I feel like it, it's really accessible and it's really accessible also for artists. And uh, this way you don't need to buy an expensive scanner, which anyway won't even tile your texture, so you're gonna need someone to tile them. And um, yeah, that's it. Are you guys still alive? <laughs> Oh, I went really fast. Okay. Um, <laughs> do any of you have any questions? I feel like I'm gonna have a lot of questions because this. Well, the tile tool is a Unity tiling tool, which is not available as of now, but will be. 
it, it will be it, no, no, it will be delivered in 2018.3. Yeah. Again, just write me an email if you want it. I can send it to you. It's yeah. not a big deal. Just there's no documentation attached to it, but you have those videos. So the only reason it was not uh, released is because there was no documentation. That was the only reason why. Yeah, and I was basically testing it. Like yeah. while doing this workflow, I was uh, I was actually testing the workflow. It was something that was uh, created but was but was not tested. So everything I've tested it for a while, and uh, you can see that how it works in this presentation. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, any type of material that doesn't work so well with it. Reflective material, obviously, yeah. because you're, you have a flash, right? Yeah, you, uh, for photometry, you really need to have, uh, it works really well with uh, non-shiny surfaces. So you can't have like car paints or metals or anything that's really reflective. Yes? Yes, that's exactly how I did it. Except for, like I said, except for like uh, metals, car paints, and all these <laughs> transparent glass, yeah. Can you say it again, please? No, it's, it, it's yeah. instead of moving yeah. the flash, yeah. you move the camera. You move, yeah, you move the. I agree, but then you would have to move your lens filter too. Right now, it's yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's true. You could put something that rolls. Yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, again, that process is you know, it's just. I feel one like it's way. something that should be tested, but yeah. there are a lot of other ways to do it, like. We have this arrow on top. You have like everything was calculated from our workflow, but you obviously can change it depending on what you want to do. Because the philosophy behind all of this is just to generate these maps using different light information, and from no, that you can. But he's right. If you put on the yeah. rotating, it does the same thing, right? Yeah. You rotate the, the sample instead of rotating the flash. But uh, the distance was. But if you rotate the sample, mm -hmm. you won't. When you're all gonna average these out, they're not gonna add it at the same place. It's going to be exactly the same. Yeah, yeah it's the, okay, the okay. Yeah, it's yeah, the, okay, the, the whole bad. tripod, basically. The, My bad, I need yeah. graphic <laughs> visualization. Yeah. Yes, actually, the distance is one meter to two meters. It's right? like uh, 120 centimeters. Yeah, exactly. What is that in? What? It's OK, they know centimeters. Okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Doing one. More than eight. Uh, more than eight. We haven't tried more than eight. So our workflow always work with with eight because four. I feel like well, four is not enough. And I feel like uh, maybe like having. I don't know. Actually, I feel like having more wouldn't be that effective. But you can obviously try it. Like uh, these really expensive photometry rooms, they have much more angles yeah. than eight. Eight is like the solution. I guess it's the optimized solution for cost and efficiency. Yes. Yeah, you could. I mean, you could you could do that. You can. I have some. Um, I have some uh, materials that aren't completely like opaque. I have ones that are slightly shiny. And it like works. leather. We, like, our, le our leather, yeah. you know, they... We they had just... like a shiny-ish leather and it yeah. worked. Like it just only really reflective materials. Yes? Have you experimented with like the chalk spray paint or the reflective materials to, to make them matte? Oh. oh, I haven't. No, we haven't. No, we have not. It's a good idea, actually. We'll yeah, try it. It's interesting. Looks fun. Yes. Uh, we have, we have. Uh, I don't know if you've played with HDRP, but we have um, an anisotropic uh, setting. setting that you can activate. So you'd need an, you'd need different kind of maps to do anisotropic, but um, you can do it with like these three maps that I showed and just play with it uh, and just tweak it in Unity with the anisotropic filter. And also, everything that was on the presentation, like the canal and all that, we will have videos for you guys. So it's not like you have to guess what happened in there. The, the thing you skipped? Yeah. yeah. I skipped a lot of stuff. I know. 
All right. I think that covers it. Yep, yeah, and we'll be outside. Yeah, we'll be outside for the Q and A session. If anybody has any other question that they want to ask. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. C'est bon, Camille.